Good afternoon. This is the first time we've actually come together really early for a Saturday session with Horsey Hawkesbury. Buckets it's been a while. Welcome to Cat Space. It has been a while. How are you? We've missed you. Yeah, I'm, I'm well. I, I keep taking sabbaticals, you see, and so they last, <laughs> it happens every seven weeks. That's the problem. Viewers, we've missed so, this Hawk, wonderful Hawk, man. Hawk is back. And Hawk is all right. <laughs> so, okay, before we start, I'd like to say welcome to the new subscribers and viewers. Welcome to the current subscribers and viewers. If you mm. like what you see, don't forget to subscribe, like, and comment. Let your friends know about Cat Space. We are also now on Spotify and on Anchor. Make sure you follow us there and just let us know what you think. If there's a topic you'd like us to pick, let us know in the comment section. We have a Facebook page for Cat Space and now a Twitter page, twitter.com forward slash Cat Space podcast. Let's get started. Today's session is all about Australian homegrown. Today's topic is Scott Morrison versus the Honourable Anthony Albanese. First question is, is Anthony Albanese a more suitable, stronger candidate for prime minister, or should we be sticking with a liberal government? Um, okay, so I actually like Anthony Albanese because I've actually met him. And um, he's actually a really, really nice guy. Um, but I have voted for liberal in the past um, because there have been occasions where Labor has been completely useless in um, places like Penrith, for example. So I've, I've actually voted for both sides before. I've even voted for the Greens, amazingly. Um, so I, I think Albanese right now, based off how he's treating um, the COVID crisis um, and mm. how Scott Morrison is treating the COVID crisis and everything that's going on in Sydney and the rest of Australia, I think Albanese would be a really good candidate. As far as the Liberal Party is concerned, there are lots of really good members that the Liberal Party should be using now, but they're not. So unless they dump um, Scott Morrison, I don't see them winning, to be perfectly honest. Pausing. The election's next year, isn't it? Mm -hmm. The next federal election is supposed to be next year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I've never voted Labor, um, and I don't follow politics to a great extent. Um, I'm leaning on the side of saying that I think neither of the major parties are any good anymore, and I tend to vote for smaller parties. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think that. Um, the inconsistencies in the way Morrison has handled the current crisis is not, is not uh, doesn't deserve anybody's vote for mine. Yes, I, I, I agree. I, I, I don't, I, I think that he, this is like, I mean, like I thought John Howard was probably like, honestly, the worst prime minister that we ever had. Um, but even then um, John Howard did create a lot of good policies. Um, mm. But it just seems to me that what's worse than John Howard is just um, no leadership. And mm. just it's it's not my fault. It's someone else's. And, and when you have a prime minister in power that is literally blaming everyone else but yourself mm. or wishes to not do anything and then says, look, just, just pass it on to this guy, that that's... That's really bad. I mean, that shit might work, excuse my language, that, that might actually work for um, the hospitality industry when um, you're, you're going to go, oh, yeah, the, the, you know, this, this beer doesn't taste right. I want a new one. And um, you know, I'm sure I'd basically go, oh, yeah, okay, let me just go get, you know, my manager when I'm the manager. <laughs> the manager's not here at the moment. I'm sure that works for the hospitality industry quite well, but it's not going to work for politics. So, <laughs> yeah, I don't think, uh, I mean, their, their leadership is something that's been missing for some years. I thought John Howard was a great leader. Mm. And you knew where you stood with John Howard, even if you didn't agree with what his policy was or what his view was, you knew that that was the view he held and he didn't waver from it and you knew why generally. So I appreciate that. And I disagree with you, Phil. I think that John Howard was one of the best prime ministers Australia has had. Um, whichever party he was connected with actually doesn't matter. I thought that his work was excellent. I also think that Bob Hawke was a good Prime Minister. Yes. 
Um, so, yeah, but I've, I've, for a long time, I haven't voted for the major parties at all. If I may interject on this, you both bring up a valid point or points. Okay, so here's where I look at it, long story short. Currently, we have a government, as mm. you said, that's failed us miserably in this crisis. We began this crisis over a, exactly a year ago, April, May, June, July, or a year and five months ago. We're nearing a year of six months now. And we started out under lockdown for three months. Now we are back mm. in a situation where we are under strict lockdown and even now with the curfew. If you look at this government under Scott Morrison, failed us miserably on vaccine rollouts, failed us miserably on mm. vaccinations, failed us miserably on leaving us high and dry when our country was burning to the ground, um, mm. failing us on unable to answer questions from journalists from Canberra, can't tell the truth, walks away from agendas, walks away from the Australian people, says to the Australian people, I don't hold a hose, mate, not my problem, deal with it. While you have... Well, that's one of the things John Howard used to say, he used to talk about the Australian people and what they wanted. I don't think I've ever heard Scott Morrison do that. Now, we have the Honourable Anthony Albanese, who has the empathy, has the kindness, has the care factor, has the leadership. He looks like a leader. He mm. projects himself mm. as a leader. He sounds like a leader. He behaves like a leader. Mm. He has brought, and I've read his policies, and I have to admit, back in the day, in my younger years, and I'm almost 40, is that every federal election I've gone why should I care about voting for whoever? I don't care. They have done nothing for me. They don't care about me. They don't care about policies. They don't care about the country. Now I look mm. at this government, again, they don't care about any Australians. You're looking at Gladys Berejiklian, who has Dr. Kerry Kent by her side, has Brad Hazard by her side in the press conferences, and is going, we are now on 865 locally acquired cases all have some have a connection but the thing is if you're locking down your government if you're locking down your country and your mm. citizens with a curfew can you please explain where on god's green earth are these cases coming from and why why aren't you handling they don't know no why aren't you handling they, they don't know nor do they know what they're doing no i don't that's think the thing. They have i agree any idea what they're doing or how to handle the virus and they don't realize either that the virus probably can't be handled it'll exactly. just do its thing um yeah. and I, I there are inconsistencies every day in the things that they say and the things that they tell us we should be doing or should not be doing or allowed to do it changes like the wind and exactly. i no longer uh, pay attention to what they're saying to be honest i mean i hear things and i know what i need to know but i'm not exactly uh, watching the press conferences anymore because it's a it's a dog's breakfast, to be honest. It really is. If you, sorry, let me just finish up. I'm sorry. I have to because I'm passionate. With the Albanese government, we are looking at faster, more efficient vaccine rollouts. We are looking at every state will receive more doses of not just AstraZeneca, but Pfizer. We are looking at more mm. children being vaccinated. We are looking at a way out, even though Gladys Berejiklian says, you know, we're looking forward to a bright future and this is our way out to reach 80%. Once we reach 80%, those who have been fully vaccinated or receive the first dose can actually go and live their lives. But if you look at the Albanese government, he's interjecting more vaccines, more rollout of vaccines, more people being vaccinated, $300 for the per people who have been fully vaccinated by the 1st of December. Then he's talking mm. about, um, then he's talking about, parents being able to go back to work, children going back to school, a way out of lockdown, mm. the economy and tourism brought back in Australia. He said, we cannot live well, like this. Must happen to um, I, could, I, I just like to, it say, must happen just like to say a couple of things, right? So um, about the escalation of people getting COVID, um, particularly the Delta virus. Um, yes, it's spreading like crazy, but I do actually notice one thing that's been happening. So, 
Um, we've probably been in, uh, in, in Sydney in really harsh lockdown, probably the harshest that we've experienced in um, maybe um, Australia. Um, mm. you know, it's prob probably at the level of Melbourne, right? So uh, we've been experiencing that. But what has what um, the state government actually been doing? Well, they've brought in the military and the police mm. and there's, they've been... Um, you know, house checks. Now, I wonder, I can't prove it, but I wonder maybe the reason why there's such a spike of the Delta variant is because the military and the police are visiting everyone's houses. And there might mm. be some soldiers that actually have the Delta variant and just don't mm. know it. So that's a really, that's something that we should be thinking about. The second thing is about the Albanese thing. I am I, I I am sure that Albanese will become the president of the Prime Minister of Australia, um, the next federal election. But it is important to note that Scott Morrison has promised to purchase um, uh, COVID vaccines from the Pfizer um, into next year. So even if Albanese says, "Hey, I've brought this many vaccines into the country." It won't be possible without the Liberal Party buying them now, um, even though Albanese might take credit for it. And this is exactly the same thing that um, Biden took credit for, um, for, even though it was the Trump administration that invested into... Operation um, Warp Speed. Well, they, they invested into four different vaccines. But within like a month, Biden took um, credit for bringing in the vaccine when it was really Trump that invested in the money to find a vaccine. So I wonder if Albanese, if he is voted in, which I'm sure he will be, um, if he'll take credit for things that Scott Morrison has accomplished. Um, and I think the reason why, I think the reason why a lot of people don't like Scott Morrison is because he's a guy that doesn't show any leadership. He's a guy that doesn't show any empathy, which I think is really, really important. Whereas Albanese, um, he's showing leadership, even though he's not a leader and he doesn't really have a power to basically move anything right now. Um, but he's showing a lot of empathy towards people. And I think that is really, really important because when you have a government that kind of removes itself from a people and says, well, you know, we, we just do policies, but we don't really care. It's not our responsibility to show empathy. It's just our responsibility mm -hmm. to write policy. I think that'll be the killer for Scott Morrison. So even though Scott Morrison did increase um, the job seeker level from what was the equivalent mm. of the new start, because the new start was about 400 bucks and then it got increased by about a hundred bucks after that, even though he did increase the Centrelink pensions because he shows no empathy whatsoever to his people, that's going to be the thing that's going to crucify him in my honest opinion. The last well, that's how the cycle goes, isn't it? I mean, you know, the government, um, Albanese has obviously recognised those things that are lacking in Morrison's leadership, and so he is bringing them out himself. So that may just be a clever ploy. Mm. And when he gains government, I mean, the same thing may happen. He may, not perhaps in those areas, but in other areas, fall down himself mm. um, once he's got the uh, once he's in the chair. So that's just the cycle, and that that's why. You know, the people become um, unhappy with the, with the incumbent government after a few years and so they're voted out. And so um, it's been many years since a particular party has been in government for more than about seven or eight years. I think the last one was, uh, I mean, John Howard was there for 10 or 11 years, wasn't he? Yes, he, 10 years. He, he was the second I mean, he was prime minister. Now, there was a prime minister who was there for about 30 years in the mid middle of the 20th century. I forget who it was, whether it was Menzies or... No, Menzies, um, was, Menzies was the longest, but uh, yeah. John Howard was the second longest. Now, the last, okay. thing, the last thing I want to say about this before we bring on the next topic is that, uh, again, as Buckets has said and as and you said with the valid points, is Albanese... The Honourable Anthony Albanese is the man to say, here I am, I'm going to guide us through it, through, through, through this pandemic. The other thing is you have, I'm not trying to bring religion into this, but part of me is upset because you have Scott Morrison who considers himself a Pentecostal prime minister. 
And mm. we have the governor, the honorable governor general of our country who stands in replacement of the queen, her majesty, the queen, mother England. Mm. He represents her because we're a Commonwealth country. From what I've heard is he's also Pentecostal, if I'm not mistaken. Now the governor general needs to put aside, and I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be angry and passionate, but he needs to put aside his friendship with Scotty for marketing because mm. <laughs> he, the governor general needs to sit down and he needs to have his file in front of him. He needs to have either on uh, Zoom or speaker dial or have the prime minister go to him or go to the prime minister and say, Scott, you may be my close friend, but the way this country is running, you're doing a terrible job. You and Berjiklin are doing, your government is doing a terrible job. You can mm. no longer service us. You don't know how to answer questions. You run away from the truth. You don't care. You show no empathy. You don't show, you, no show action. You show no action. You're deliberately wasting time. The vaccines that we're supposed to be getting, the Moderna, even though it's been it's coming to this country, won't be rolled out till next year. It should be rolled out by December, but it's not. Mm. Okay? That, that has to happen very quickly. The Governor General should certainly be impartial. And he's and not. Friendship shouldn't come into it. I mean, in life, with it, whatever role you're playing, it's never a hundred percent correct because, that friendships yeah. don't come into the way you uh, you act in your role. I mean, it, it, it always does. I but mean, on the face of it, the governor general should be impartial. Certainly. I mean, we have. He makes. You know, we have. We had the late great True Blue Gough Whitlam. He was. Removed for far less worse. Yeah, but he was popular. Yeah, as he well. was popular. But the thing is, mm. you have a man who looks at the Australian public and says, I don't know, hold a hose, mate. Not my problem. I know the ministers sign off on everything. Mr. Prime Minister, don't you have a say in this? I don't have a hose, mate. I don't sign anything off. The ministers sign everything. The health well, needs to look after it. Let's give Anthony Albanese a go and see how it goes. But as I said before, I don't think. Um, either of the major parties, it makes a great deal of difference in the end. There are different policies and they have different strengths and weaknesses. But yeah, uh, in the end, most people who go into politics, if they rise that high, are no longer really concerned about the Australian people. They're concerned about themselves, largely. Well, I, um, they I, begin well, but they realise that they can get so much out of it that by the time they rise that high, as I said, they've lost the perspective. And I think that has certainly happened with Scott Morrison. I think it's certainly happened with Gladys Berejikli and, and perhaps the health people as well who've suddenly been given so much power. Whether it will happen with Anthony Albanese, not at first, but it probably will occur at some stage. Well, yeah. that's, that's probably true, but it's interesting that Kat mentioned Gough Whitlam because the thing is, the same thing actually happened to Gough Whitlam. And mm. Gough Whitlam's, uh, sorry, uh, basically the, the governor general um, at the time, I, I can't remember what his name was, but he was actually, John Kerr. yeah, John Kerr. There we go. He was actually good friends with Gott Whitlam anyway. So mm -hmm. he actually had to, to seriously consider, well, I, I do have a friend, uh, friendship with Goth, um, but is my friendship um, with Goth worth sacrificing the um, uh, Australian people? And the answer is no, it wasn't. And even though there was maybe a little bit, little discrepancies. Money, well, there was a little. I'll speak. Thank you. Even though there was a little bit of money left, that I reckon the um, it would have been two or three months before the the um, treasury was completely bankrupt. Even though they said no, it's bankrupt now. Um, that he literally had to make the di difficult decision to say, look, if we if we don't sack Goth now. Um, we're going to bankrupt the whole country in mm. two months. And he won't stop because he's passionate and mm. he wants to make changes, but he's he doesn't know anything about budgeting. And it's true. He knew nothing about budgeting. I mean, he he allowed people to go to university for a dollar. When have you ever mm. known anyone in any period of time, other than the time of Goth Whitlam, um, to actually go to a top university for a dollar? I mean, it's no wonder that the, the country was about to go bankrupt. Um, well, it was so, free, actually. I, I think that, that lasted into the early 90s, um, where a scheme was brought in to pay back some of the costs of university courses, but it was nowhere near the real cost. Hmm. 
Um, and I, I don't think it happens even now in the higher education contribution no, scheme, whatever no. it's called now. Um, I don't think we pay the real cost. Um, you know? Students from overseas certainly pay the real cost and that's what keeps the universities afloat. But uh, local students make, as I said, a contribution. So it, it, what Whitlam started in the free education system really or the cut price education system hasn't really ever gone away. It's stuck with us. Mm. And yeah, I'm not sure that that was a good thing. I really am not um, because you had people going to university for not really for the reason of wanting to study they just thought it was a good lifestyle in fact it still was when i was at university in the early 90s it was a great lifestyle and um if you had had to pay the real cost of the, the, the course it would have been quite different mm. and there were still a lot of people there in those days who were just professional students who just used to go to do one course for a year and then they'd change to a different one never finish any of them but they would spend 10 years at university and in their spare time, which was, they had a lot of spare time, they would go to protests wearing black jackets with um, badges all over them and appear on television at, at every single protest that was going around. Yeah. They didn't even know why they were doing that. It was just great fun. And there was a band playing in the park at the end of the march. Mm -hmm. So the Gough Whitlam's policies did breed a lot of people who just didn't care and were lazy and thought, oh, I'm going to get what I can get out of this. And that is very sad, actually. Yeah. Now, the next question I want to look at is, um, sorry, will we have a more secure, stable government under the under Labor to push us forward into a brighter, more economic, stronger Australia? That's what the Labor Party used to talk about, um, making Australia strong, which is why they were connected with the union movement back in the day. Mm. Um, they cared about the common man, uh, to, coin, to use a phrase, uh, perhaps the common person. They cared about the workers. They cared about those who were struggling to pay the bills. Um, in the last couple of decades, that seems to have gone from many Labor politicians, but perhaps it's making a return. And that would be good to see, in which case, yeah, we will. Um, they would push us into a brighter and stronger Australia as they used to do, you know, 40, 50, 60 years ago. So maybe. Thoughts? Buckets? Can you read that question for me sure. again, because it's quite quick. Okay. Will we have a more secure, stable government under Labor to push us forward into a brighter, more economic and stronger Australia? Well, it's got to be better than now. I mean, everything, and everything's going to be better than now. Um, I, 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 I think that's a, like uh, Horsey said, that's, that's, that's a typical Labor slogan. And, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure if they take care of, all areas of the government, not just health. Don't get me wrong. I mean, health is a really important one because health basically controls everything. If people aren't healthy, they can't work. So I, to I totally understand that. But I think um, if Labor um, decides to take care of all sectors of government as opposed to just one sector of government, mm. um, I, I think they could potentially um, have a better, a, a better shot at it than Liberal are at the moment. And that's my honest opinion. If I may interject, with the, with this idea, of, and this is as Buckets and you, so this is a label slogan, I think with the Honourable Anthony Albanese on our side um, leading us, he will lead us to a brighter, stronger, healthier economic Australia because we are looking at if we do find ourselves on a way out, for example, as I'm not going to bring, I'm only going to bring this up for a short period, the Labor, Liberal government does not have an ETA on a way out. But mm. if the Labor government gives us an ETA on a way out, it will be better and healthy and stronger and brighter because, one, tourism will return back to the country because people have been fully vaccinated and have a vaccine passport, will mm. be able to come to this country, will be able to go overseas. To interstate, will be able to go interstate anyway, fully vaccinated, economy will boom again. Three, it'll enhance not just medical, but it'll enhance uh, a way for people to be um, to be more excited and eager about getting vaccinated. Under the Liberal government, people are, there are people who are choosing not to get vaccinated. There are people who are COVID deniers, anti-vaxxers. Why? Because this government, no one trusts them. Yeah, I, I can I just say something with that? I think with the whole anti-vaxxer thing that's been going on, there's a lot of misinformation that's been 
going around. Mm. And um, because, unfortunately, there have been vaccinations that haven't been as successful as other vaccines or it hasn't quite mm. worked out or there was a rush and it wasn't, there wasn't any proper stages to take um, the, the vaccine and because it, it, it did feel like a bit like a zombie apocalypse and then there's the devastation of the zombie apocalypse. Um, because well, there were some people nothing, who got very ill from it. Pe people are scared. And so when, when, you, when you say things like um, something bad's going to happen to you if you take um, the AstraZeneca um, virus if you're not 60, but it's perfectly okay for a bunch of um, mm. uh, St. Joseph students to, um, to take it um, under accidentally. The, uh, accidentally under the age of 18. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a bit of hypocrisy there and people get scared so that mm. they're like, well, hang on a minute. If you're saying that I can't take this vaccine, um, you know, uh, unless I'm 60, okay, yet um, a bunch of high school students took it and they're fine. And now mm. you're saying that anyone under 40 can take the AstraZeneca and is encouraged to take the Andres and AstraZeneca, you're actually mm. giving me false information. And because that information, um, you know, is, um, again, false and we're, it, it, because everyone has been forced to stay at home, it's made everyone very, very paranoid and scared to get the well, vaccine. A so, lot of fear out there. Yeah. And the, actually, the, I had that problem when I had my vaccination it was the AstraZeneca and I rocked up to the doctor's surgery and he explained the very, very low risk of blood clots and those sorts of things. And he says, look, if you're not feeling well and you take a tablet, you've got a headache and it doesn't go away, you would seek treatment, wouldn't you? And I said, yes, I would. And he said, well, that's fine. That's what all you've got to do. Um, and he said that it was, you know, very, very small proportion of people had these blood clots and could, could pass away from it. And I said, right, I accept that. And that's not a problem. There was an argument at the front desk because I wasn't of an age yet to have the AstraZeneca and the doctor came out and he said yes he can have it and there was an argy bargy going back and forth and uh, I nearly I was standing there in the middle of this and I nearly said oh for heaven's sake forget it and walk out I thought for goodness sake you know but I had the vaccination and uh, a week or so later they decided that I was now of an age where I could have that particular vaccination so there are mixed messages one or the other of those messages was false and trust of governments is at an all-time rock bottom low buckets, isn't it? Mm. It is. It's, oh, well, it's, and that's, a, that's a problem because when people are in fear and they don't trust their leaders, yeah. do you they're think they're going to trust what the leaders tell them? No, they're not. And that they may pay lip service to it, but their heart's not there. Mm. And that means that whatever measures are trying to be brought in, whether in good faith or bad, by the government to... Um, stem the, the spread of the virus if people's hearts aren't in it then yeah when the, when the police are looking they're going to appear to be doing the right thing but when they've gone around the corner they're going to say to hell with it you know and that's not good that's not good uh, you know what I, I think you know all all we really legitimate and excuse me for actually saying this but all we legitimately have to do is change whoever's basically um in, uh, got the top job, which is Albanese or anyone else for that matter, um, mm -hmm. rebrand the COVID vaccine to another name so people begin to trust it again. Because uh, right now people have a, a word association with AstraZeneca and freak out. Um, mm -hmm. And basically um, say, oh no, this one's okay, but this one isn't okay. Please don't take this one, but please take this one. And that will literally solve all the problems in Australia. But because you've got because um, the government saying yes, no, yes, no, yes on the condition, no on the condition, um, people are freaking out. They don't know what to do. No one wants to die. Okay, no one wants to die, and no one wants to. No one wants to take the wrong thing. And so it isn't a surprise, really, that um, people are losing trust in the Morrison government um, because of the the frequency of misinformation and. Fear. Uh, fear and the amount of flip-flopping that's going on in government that well, consistency that, that, is the thing yeah, yeah consistency, consistency is key if, if you if you tell someone bad news but it's consistent bad news mm. you'll get mm. more trust from your people than if you were to tell mm. them good news than bad news and good news than bad news because no one knows what to believe exactly mm. speaking mm. of flip-flopping all right go on my next question is 
with Scott Morrison flip-flopping on, it's a race, it's not a race, it's okay to have the vaccine, it's not okay to have a vaccine, and many other topics that Scott Morrison flip-flops on, is this, a, is this a sign of poor leadership, which is hurting Australia rather than leading Australia? So we actually covered that. We I just think. covered that 30 seconds ago. Yeah. So, so just so, so for all those people that haven't quite understood the question, just rewind the, the, the answers. Uh, as of 10 seconds ago, and you'll get everything. <laughs> okay, I know we've just talked about this, and I'm not trying to circle. I've This question, I look at it in a different point of view through my own eyes, and these are just opinions. I'm not here to, you know, anger anyone or insult anyone or offend anyone. This question for me, I look at it as from different angles, different point of views, and that mm -hmm. is when it comes to flip-flopping, you're looking at... It's a race. Oh, no, it's not a race. We can take our time. We'll get the vaccines. Don't worry about it. I'm not going to tell you anything to, oh, yeah, it is a race. We have to hurry. We are, we, I think we're 83rd on the world stage when it comes to uh, vaccinating uh, vaccinations or vaccine rollout. We're 83rd in the world. And then you have the prime minister going, oh, we're like the Olympic athletes. We are going to go for gold, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. We're going to swim for that gold. We're going to get that gold. We're like Olympic athletes. Australia's the best. Yeah, but the um, problem is we have to watch the swimming, like, <laughs> you know, for three days straight, you know, because there's literally nothing on and they won't watch, let me watch the soccer. Uh, Mr. Prime, I want to say, Mr. Prime Minister, either tell us the truth or just mm. go home to Kiribati, let the Honourable Anthony Easy take the lead, please. <laughs> don't talk anymore. Don't photo ops, no interviews, because we are yeah. not Olympic athletes. We are, no, some of us are. We are Australia. <laughs> yes, there's some of us are, but we are Australians. This is your Australia. We are a mm. laughing stock on the world stage. Country well, well, apparently we are right at the moment. Apparently the, the US and the UK are laughing at the way Australia is trying to deal with the pandemic and the, um, the severe lockdowns because they have realised that these severe lockdowns actually don't work. And all they do is um, is push back the uh, the moving of the virus through the community, which is kind of going to do anyway. Um, so they they are laughing at Australia. And very few countries have got to 80% vaccinated. Actually, there's only one country, whether it was Liechtenstein, one of those very small countries that actually has reached 80%. The rest of the major countries in the world around the 40 to 60% mark um, even after all this time. So whether we will reach 80% or not, I don't know. It's going to take some time. You, I don't honestly think you'll reach 80% with the amount mm. of division that is currently in our country at the moment. Mm. There's no way. There are people that um, simply will not take it because they think it's poison um, mm. and um, are just afraid of it. So I, I don't... I mean, I, I, I pray, honestly, I pray that people don't see it as poison and just take it so we can get out mm. of the lockdown. But I'm also a realist and I mm. don't see it actually happening this year um, or any year for that matter because it, once people are basically stubborn in their ways, they, they, mm. it, would, it will literally take a lot for them to break um, their stubbornness. Mm. And, and that's just something... See, even if they're not stubborn, I, I tried to get the second vaccination earlier. It's due in about three weeks. And I rang the doctor's surgery where I had the first one. I said, look, can I come earlier? It says on the news that I'm able to have it a few weeks earlier than I was otherwise going to. And they said, well, yeah, you can, but the trouble is we haven't got any appointment spots, so you're better off keeping the appointment you've got, otherwise it'll be further pushed further back. So I said, right, yeah. So that's the other problem as well. The, the opportunities for people to have the vaccination are um, limited by the number of doctor surgeries and places where it's possible to, to get it. And it just isn't possible to get 80% of the population vaccinated within that space of time. Mm. You know? The last thing I'm going to say about this is when this first started, now we're back in it. Why, Mr. Prime Minister, do you keep our international borders open we are in a lockdown why are you bringing mm. international yeah. superstar celebrities to join reality tv when we are in lockdown <laughs> our people are dying close 
the international borders. Well, at least bring in good celebrities. Like, don't don't really bring in celebrities that everyone hates. Like, did you hear about who was the royal <laughs> one that that wanted to join Celebrity Big Brother? What was that? Oh, oh yeah, Meghan Markle's half brother, Thomas I, Markle I, Jr. I, I, I don't want Why him in this country. Bring, I'm sorry, I'm passionate. I'm not angry. Stay in America. I'm I'm passionate. Forgive me, Horsey. I'm passionate. I'm fired up because. Why? 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 We could have ended this in the first mm, mm. strike. The iron, they could have struck the iron and they could have said, no, close these borders mm. now. Close the international borders. We are in the most dangerous times of our lives. You go, you can't even go outside to access for only an hour. I haven't left my house. That's how frightened I am. I, I, look, I, I, I certainly I, think that. All I'm saying is that they could, if they were going to ask an American celebrity to come here, they should have just asked Kate Winslet. And oh wait, she's English. She's English. Damn it! <laughs> no, here's here's why I'm angry. It's because you're giving us a curfew. Well, anyway. You're giving us a curfew. You're giving us lockdown. What? I mean, forgive me. I I have no words. I'm I'm gonna cry because it's like. See, I this... think I uh, packed that, um, that at the beginning. Those Australians who are overseas should have been allowed to return home immediately. There are some people who are still overseas. They cannot get back into the country, and they live here. I think that's quite unfair, but I agree with you. I think the international borders should have been closed immediately. None of this state by state business that's been going on, um, that's never happened in Australia, closing of state borders and that sort of thing, and you know, all that, not letting citizens of the country go from one state to another, but the international border certainly, and we may well have been in a better situation than we are now. Maybe, maybe not, um, but still it's, it's um, as I said before, I, I I don't know why the the governments don't realise that the lockdown actually won't work. Uh, the zero COVID uh, policy that some people seem to be heading towards, it's a bit like zero deaths on the road, you know, towards zero and all that. It hasn't happened and it'll probably never happen. Yes, improvements are being made and that's good. But to say we want to get to zero is unrealistic. Yeah. And I think with COVID, it's unrealistic to say we want to get to zero. And to hold out until we're at zero, <laughs> It's, I mean, there was something happened in, was it Queensland the other day or, or Victoria where one case appeared and so a lockdown was brought in. I think it was Queensland for yeah. three or four days um, because of the appearance of one COVID case out of a population of well, how many million people live in Queensland? Two or three million, I suppose, three or four million. So it's lunacy, it really is. And I, I can't understand why they don't realise um, if what they're doing hasn't been effective so far, why would it be effective in the immediate or near future? What yeah. will change to make it suddenly effective when it hasn't been for the last 6, 12, 18 months? So there's no understanding there, is there? Good <laughs> question. Here's, here's where that one ties up with it, okay? Is the Honourable Anthony Albanese's late, uh, is the Honourable Anthony Albanese's Labour government the change we need in order to move forward and into the right direction. Um, again, uh, anyone that's, it doesn't really matter if it's Albanese or someone else. Uh, to be perfectly honest, anyone that's better than, anyone that's not Scott Morrison could, to be perfectly honest, do a much better job. So that, you know, and, and that, that counts for Liberal or Labor, to be perfectly honest. Anyone that's not Scott Morrison just... right now could do a much better job. Mm. So a house has just burned down. Consider a house has just burned down. And the occupants are standing near the mailbox, which is the only thing that survived. And a guy rocks up with a truck full of timber and bricks and says, oh, I can build you a new house. What do you think they're going to say? Of mm. course, it's going to be better than the house that's there now because it's gone. <laughs> so <yeah. laughs> so the, answer, the answer is yes, it must be. Yes, but the, the question is, is it built of bricks and mortar or is it built straw? Or, or, or is the guy basically going to say, yes, I've got the bricks, um, I've, I've got the roofing, um, I've got everything else, but I need some cement. Does anyone, who's got the cement? Where do we get cement from? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I think Random. this is getting a bit complicated now. Random <laughs> question. <laughs> sorry. I didn't Random. mean to take that, that analogy that far. I'm sorry. I don't know. <laughs> Random thought I could think of before the next question is that Scott Morrison Liberal Government is like, the three little pigs 
and he's the wolf and he's gonna come and he's gonna huff and he's gonna puff and he's gonna blow your house down he's gonna huff and puff all over australia and australia's gonna it's like your house he's gonna blow it all the way does that mean like the the um the uh, what, what's the fishing and, and hunting uh party oh damn the shooters and fishers party anyway, the, yeah the shooters yeah. and fishermen party is that they're gonna, are they going to cut his head off <laughs> but is, is that how that's going to work <laughs> but, or, or is it like <laughs> or is it the unions because of the lumberjacks or is it like <laughs> sorry before i go to the next one and i'm carrying on but is, or is or is it like the three uh gold locks and three bears this porridge was too cold this porridge was was too warm this porridge is just right and then after that we sell, we, we sell porridge to scotland wonderful if we next go question next question further, it sounds like a minister of tourism go, Kat, if we go if we go too much further uh you say scott morrison is the wolf then uh, there are a lot of people at the moment where the wolf is very close to their door and they haven't got any porridge because the cupboard is nearly bare. So <laughs> I, I just thought I'd make that observation because I something, love needs, that. I love something that. needs to be done about, seriously, something needs to be done about that situation that many mm. Australians are in very, very, very quickly. And I don't think the answer is giving him a 700 bucks a week out of the coffers, which are empty anyway. Here's the next question. What will, what will Anthony Albanese's government bring to Australia to improve the country and nation? I know we've said this, but I'll, I'll say this. What he will bring is more vaccine rollout, more people getting vaccination, the economy, tourism. He'll put money back into the government, our aged care, health services, our loved ones who are in nursing homes, are, mm. you know, with underlying medical conditions are dying before our eyes and they're not able to get their vaccinations done. So well, we, we hope. We and, hope they do. Right, and so the thing is, we, the thing is, like, um, as much as I do support Albanese, um, he can make all the promises he wants, but he still has to deal with COVID. Yeah. And he still has to deal with the fact that Australia is basically bankrupt. Um, mm. And he still has to deal with the fact on how he's going to restore Australian jobs. And mm. just basically any industry um, that has one COVID case or at least a suspected COVID case gets shut down. He literally has to deal with the same problems that Scott Morrison has to deal with. Mm. Now, I'm sure that then he might have a few ideas on how to change that. Um, but if you think that the problems are going to change, uh, sorry, the, um, the problems are going to go away if he's just in government. Uh, I'm afraid that's not yeah. how it's going to work. He has yeah. to deal with the same issues that Scott Morrison's got. And Scott Morrison's not coping very well. So, mm. I mean, I, 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 like, again, if he says he's going to bring back jobs, okay. Um, if he brings back jobs in, say, construction, what happens if there's someone that shows up in construction that's got COVID? He has to shut everyone down again. Um, well, no, it doesn't have to, and that's that's what's got to change. I think, Phil. I think the the, the way of dealing with COVID has to change markedly, hmm. um, because it's it's not going to go away, and we have to learn to live with it, as other countries now learn to live with it, and without shutting down an industry because a case appears. That's quite unreasonable. It really is, um, because that case may be someone who has no symptoms. And uh, if you have no symptoms and you're not feeling sick, then you have to ask the question, uh, and in times past, this was always the way, does it really matter? Mm. Well, yes, you can pass it on to, to other people who may well become sick, but that has always been the way. And I personally don't, I'm not a fan at all of getting tested if you're not feeling sick for something that you may or may not have. If Mother Nature tells you that something's wrong, she will tell you something's wrong. If she mm. doesn't, then there's nothing wrong. You don't you don't you don't dig as far as you can to find something wrong, because you can bet if everybody in the country had a medical test or two for anything that could be wrong with them, and there are a myriad of things that they could have, you'll find something wrong with everybody. There'll be no one who's got apart from perhaps a newborn baby who's got a perfect body, which is not malfunctioning in some way or numbers, some number isn't out of whack somewhere. And even that newborn baby may have a number out of whack from time to time. So what do you do with that? It's ridiculous. Point. That is a really good point. Now, here's a question I know you will love to sink your teeth into. <clears throat> Sorry. Are we now seeing a very, 
uh, are, we, are we now seeing a very definition of an quote, Orwellian totalitarian dictatorship at work for the likes that we haven't seen before? Well, okay, apart from the fact that we actually voted Scott Morrison in, um, I would say, <clears throat> yes, I mean, the, the only thing stopping Scott Morrison from actually being a full-blown dictator is the fact that we democratically elected him. Um, mm. Mm. But apart from that, um, he's still got military on the streets. Um, he's still um, uh, li limiting um, the freedoms that we have. He's still limiting the way that we can, mm. the limiting the way that we go outside, limiting mm. the way that we eat, limiting the food that we eat limiting our rights, limiting who we can see. So uh, even mm. our money and, and basically, um, you know, apart from, again, being democratically elected, um, he is even starting to think like a, um, a fairly um, dangerous dictator um, uh, who um, believes that God put them in power. So he's oh, even yeah. starting to say <laughs> things like um, God... Um, selected me to be the Prime Minister of Australia. And although I, I myself do believe in God, and I know you do believe in God, and I know so Kat, I. Kat believes in God as well. Um, well it may well be true. But this, 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 is a, this is a country where um, God doesn't actually have a vote. Um, he, I'm sure that he basically um, influences us to do the right thing in many ways, but God doesn't actually have a vote in Australia. The people have a vote. So it's the people that choose mm. their leader. So when you've got a prime minister that says, God chose me to be prime minister and that's why I'm prime minister, that's really dangerous. That's really, really, really dangerous because um, he, he'll have a, um, a, a cult following after that um, and it, it, it'll, it'll be really, really, really dangerous. And I fear that he's doing the same thing as Donald Trump, which he's basically saying, hey, I'm a messiah, worship me, and this is why I'm going to be your president. And Trump, if, um, well, for well, Trump, Trump, was the, Trump, Trump, Trump was the okay. president. So um, I think um, to say that God chose you to become prime minister or chose Donald Trump to be become the new messiah, quote unquote, chosen one, um, is mm -hmm. just a really, really dangerous way to, to lead Australian politics, to be perfectly honest. If I'm it is. A, and, um, yeah. Sorry, if I don't oh, just quickly. When you when you look at what um <clears throat> what, what George Orwell was writing about in 1984, uh, he that society was uh, characterized by the citizens always being watched and the government knowing where they were at any time and where they were where they were going. Um, there were heavy restrictions on movement and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, I do think that our society has echoes of that right at the moment. Um, for example, you know, you, you're supposed to check in with a QR code if you go and buy a cup of coffee. Previously, you could go and buy a cup of coffee and no one there knew who you were, nor did anybody know you were there. And you could just rock up and get the coffee and go away. Everywhere we go, almost, we're supposed to use QR codes now. What is being done with that information, apparently, is uh, in case uh, COVID cases visited there, so you can protect yourself against it and people know where people were. Well, that's one thing, but the potential for the QR code is to be used in a very Orwellian way. Um, I don't like QR codes. I don't support their use for that or any reason really, because I, I just don't think even for COVID it's actually necessary for things, things we've talked about before, because I, you know, we have to learn to live with COVID. Um, but yes, I, I certainly think that our society increasingly in the last 12 months or so can be described as uh, getting towards a totalitarian state. Now, if I may interject, the only thing I will lastly say about this question is that he recently, about a couple of months back, and I read this and I heard this even for an interview with, with ScoMo, he said, oh, I was at a art gallery before I became prime minister, before I was elected, I went to the art gallery and I said, God, give me a sign that I'm the I'm meant to be the prime minister. Give me a sign. And he said, he, as he was walking in the art gallery, God presented him with a picture of an eagle. We don't have eagles. America has eagles. He saw the eagle and he said, 
that was a sign from God. God put me here. God chose me to, um, to be the people's prime minister. And then he was questioned about it in the interview. And then he flip-flopped and backtracked and said, oh, no, 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 I didn't say that. I said it, but I didn't say it, but I did say it, but it wasn't said that way, but I did mean it's that way. But when you're watching Kevin Rudd, the Honourable Kevin Rudd, have the same interview and the lady at the, I think, ABC said to him, what do you think of Scott Morrison's God Chose Me? Um, he led me to a painting, a painting of an eagle, and he said, this is the most unrealistic, dangerous thing to say. It's unhealthy. It's wrong. It's uh, his. It's un. Uh, it's even unmoralistic a word. It's evil. It, he shouldn't be saying that because he's coming across as a bit weird. And he said this is really evil and this is wrong. He should not have said that. And he backtracked and you know sort of going. He said, I'm a Catholic, but when I became prime minister, I didn't go, oh, God chose me. God put me here. It was the people that elected me. I knew I had a country to run, but I didn't say I am here on behalf of God as a representative of God to, to lead you. Mm -hmm. No, he said what Scott Morrison said was dangerous. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing I want to say about that. Yeah. Um, but like I said, you know, when, um, like, like I said, I don't have a, um, a problem with, um, a faith if you're if you if you believe in god or gods for that matter um mm. that's your own personal faith that you've been brought up to believe because of, they would all have like a sense of morals and and whatnot so i don't have a real issue mm. with that to be perfectly honest um but when you like literally lie and say god chose you to be the prime minister of australia um you know, that's a sin in itself for a start, but it's also misleading. Um, and I, I, I that stuff probably is, isn't going to work in mm. Australia because we're not gullible for a start. But mm. that stuff would definitely work in America. So well, I, it would work for more people in America, yes. Um, so, so Christians I, believe that God did choose whoever is in power at the time <clears throat> and they're, they're there under God's authority. Christians believe that. But I agree with you to say it. Um, I mean, even in America, there are some people who would think it was very dangerous to talk about that sort of thing because it does give the message that you you think you've been appoint, divinely appointed as prime minister or as president and therefore you are God's man and you can kind of do what you like and you don't need to take notice of the people, which is quite wrong. And that's not how things should work in a democracy. So I agree with you. It's, it shouldn't be said. Even if to Christians it is true, it shouldn't be talked about in, the, in, um, in public by the Prime Minister because it can easily be misinterpreted. No. I, 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 well, one thing I was like, I'll just add one last thing of that, that is the thing is, if you see yourself as some sort of prophet leading a country, okay, <laughs> that literally just basically, you're basically saying to the people, I cannot be scrutinized because I am pure. Mm -hmm. And that's where it's, it's really dangerous. So, mm -hmm. so, you know, someone really needs to give um, Scott Morrison a head check and um, get him the best psychiatrist possible to realize, hey, dude, I know you're into God, but you're, you're not the son of God. Sorry. <laughs> you know, um, you know, uh, you know, like you, you, you know, um, because, you know, um, if it's, if he's in for much longer um, mm. and, you know, all these really um, strong things start happening to the country, he, he'll just go, well, God asked me to do it. Um, it. You know, I'm just doing what God's asked me to do. And that's where it's, gets dangerous. Mm. The last thing I'll add to this Next is the last, the last thing I want to point out is that if you're a Christian, why are you hiding all the Brittany Higgins stuff? Why aren't you firing the people in your cabinet? Why are you still paying them and electing them in your cabinet? Why haven't you put this to rest? Why haven't you let them go? This is dangerous. A woman who has come out saying this has happened and I'm scared and I'm frightened and he's not answering to that as a Christian. Mr. Prime Minister, really, really. That's a whole, that's a whole that's other, like, other, that's other like, discussion. That's like 
five or six questions in one go that you got to slow down okay sorry so, i'm just passionate because I, I know. there's a lot of there's a lot of wait a minute moments okay. in my head that are going out okay. on red alert okay mm. so the um the miss higgins thing obviously was the worst disgrace um of a politician um to date uh, I, i'm sure that there's been really bad situations but how that case was was handled um, was absolutely disgraceful. You had everything from, um, you know, a, a sexual assault in um, a um, area in Parliament House um, where there were no cameras. Um, you had multiple witnesses of her going into the workplace. Even when they basically brought her in to talk about it, um, they brought her to the place where she was raped um it, it every every it, it was a whole bunch of horrible and um even though scott morrison did so okay well this is pretty bad let's basically tennis the, the authorities you know an independent party should have probably investigated it and whoever was involved should have been sacked straight away um you know so i that was that was a really really bad move but the fact that scott morrison kept those ministers in power okay, um, whilst under investigation was a huge mistake. Scott Morrison should have fired those ministers straight away and not giving them back their positions until they were proven innocent. But he just kept them, he just kept them going. Look, I do apologise for my outburst. I'm, I'm just passionate and I don't mean to well, offend that, that, or upset that, or that, angry that, anyone, That's but. fine, but we all know that the Miss Higgins things that, that actually did happen was completely disgraceful, um, and it could have honestly been handled much, much better. And if Scott Morrison doesn't know that, then he's completely um, out of touch with his own people. Last question. Uh, did you want to have to say something? Um, uh, I'm just going to say that uh, this is, you know, God's man appointed position, <laughs> apparently managing that affair in that way. I'm not going to say any more. You can draw your own conclusions. <laughs> Okay. Last question. Will we see a leadership spill before the next federal election? Um, I would like to say that we will. Maybe. But to be honest, I mean, since COVID's kind of been Scott Morrison's go-to for stopping Parliament from happening, um, we may not um, have a, a leadership change until an actual proper election. Um, Those are difficult to organise in, in good times, aren't they? Leadership, you know, all the numbers, games and all that sort of contacting yeah, each other. But in, in, I, mean, like, very hard. I mean, like, we, we know for a fact that Scott Morrison literally shut down Parliament for six months um, mm -hmm. because of COVID. And that was his go to for not wanting to go to question time. Um, so, I mean, what's to stop him from if, if he thinks that he's being he there's a real high chance that he might be kicked out of office? What's to stop him just saying, okay, well, no one's going to meet in Parliament House until COVID um, is down to 80% mm. or, or 0% or whatever. So, I, again, I would like a leadership spill to happen, but during COVID, I really think it's going to be difficult unless every single minister get on the internet and basically make their case from an online server. I agree. What about an early election? Oh, that too. Uh, I, I would time. love an early election, but again, election. Scott Morrison has to approve it, and for it to be yeah. approved, it has um, to be challenged. It has to be well. I mean, like if anyone's challenging him, uh, it, uh, you know, Albanese is challenging him now. But yeah. um, in order for it to happen, he has to approve it. Um, the the government has to approve it. Um, and at the mm. moment, getting people together in the same room to make a vote to approve it is being Quite it's hard. Yeah. Again, I'm sorry for my outburst. It's I'm not passionate. No, no. We but uh, to to sort of wrap this up, I guess we want a, you know, a change of government and fairly soon. That's yeah. the yeah. only way that we could be to, to to improve the situation, given the leaders that we have at the moment and what they're doing. That's what I would. Uh, say. Yeah, I I, I think um, Scott Morrison. Uh, literally has no chance of being the prime minister because mm. um, pre right. previous prime ministers on both sides of parliament have literally got got, got together. So there's been four. Um, so John Howard, Malcolm Turnbull, um, Kevin, uh, Rudd. Kevin Rudd and Tony Abbott literally got together and mm. said, dude, you need to quit. 
you need to quit now. Yeah. You're not right for this country. And, and they were on both sides of politics. And they've all come together as one and said, listen, stop talking. Just, you, you know what? You, you, you need to stand down. You need to stand down. You need to stand down. You're not the correct prime minister. And, and for four prime, ex-prime ministers to say that, even if they're on the same mm. party, that it, it's got to be a big bloody deal. And here's the last thing for the Governor General. Put aside your mateship and really sack him. That's all I'm going to say. So. Yep, that, I, I concur. <laughs> well, thank you so maybe much. We could, um, maybe we could have it on the 11th of November this year. There's another famous sacking on the 11th of November, wasn't there? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so right. much. Thank you so much for joining us today. We have missed you and we can't wait for you to come back next week with us to talk about more fun topics. Uh, I'm Kat, this is Buckets and Horsey. Um, please subscribe to our channel, click the notification bell, uh, go to our Spotify. I will be uploading this today to Spotify and to Anchor. Invite your friends to subscribe. Leave us a comment, let you know what you thought of today and if you'd like to talk about stuff that we could do for you. Awesome. There you go. All right. Bye. Bye.